Okay, so in this one, we're gonna learn how to use transactions inside of Spring Boot. What's a transaction, you ask? Let's get right into it. So a transaction is an atomic unit of work. So it's the smallest amount of work that can happen. Not with me so far, don't worry, because here's an example about what that means. So let's say we had a buyer, buyer one, and we had another buyer, let's call them buyer two. And these buyers are in the market for a book. So they go to a bookstore, a bookstore which happens to only sell one type of book and only has one in stock. So the first buyer asks the bookstore, hey, do you have my book in stock? And the second buyer happens to ask the same question. The bookstore checks its stock and goes, yeah, buyer one, I have one of my books in stock. And buyer two, yeah, I have one of my books in stock, which is completely true at that time. They have one of their books in stock. So naturally, buyer one wants to buy that book and that transaction goes through absolutely fine. But then buyer two also wants to buy that book. But at this point, that bookstore doesn't have a book to sell. So it's all gone horribly wrong. Is there a better way of dealing with this? Yes, there is. So let's say, for example, buyer one was able to say, hey, bookstore, do you have my book in stock? The bookstore would say, yep, yeah, we have one of those. And then that buyer buys the book straight away, reducing the bookstore stock to zero. So when buyer two comes along and says, hey, do you have my book in stock? The bookstore can say, no, I do not. I have zero books in stock. And you may have guessed by now, but the dotted line is the transaction. That dotted line becomes the minimum unit of work. So everything that happens inside of that dotted line either happens altogether or not at all. So Spring Framework has loads of different technologies that it uses for persistence. So it has JDBC, it has JPA, if you don't wanna deal with any SQL, it has JDOs, it has Hibernate that works with JPA. There's loads of stuff happening under the hood. But the magic about transactions in the Spring Boot app is that it really is one transaction framework to rule them all. You do transactions exactly the same way, regardless of which technology you're using under the hood to deal with your persistence for you. There is a lot of value in transactions, going from the database right the way up through the framework. But there's one particular part of it all that we're gonna focus on today, and that's the rollback. So if you remember back to the bookstore, where we had those individual processes that happened, but then we drew a box around them and we said, they either all happen or they don't happen at all. Well, it would be a rollback that would make them not happen at all. Here's an example. So let's say we have one process inside a transaction. It goes absolutely fine. Cool. But then we have a second process that happens in that transaction, but uh-oh, this one goes wrong. We don't wanna leave our database in an invalid half-baked state. So we want those transactions to be rolled back as if they never happened at all. And I'm gonna show you how this works in the Spring Boot app. But before we jump into the app, we need to know the domain model. And lo and behold, we're gonna be using the one that you're probably already familiar with by now, the whole books and authors thing. So we have a book, ISBN is its unique identifier, a book is a title, slap bang on the front cover. But then a book has an author, and that author has, in this case, an ID to identify them, a name and an age. And we have this set up so that a book has one author, but an author can have many books. So let's get right into the code. So here we have our Spring Boot app and we have this set up to expose a REST API to deal with our books and authors. So we can create a book and an author or we can list all the books and authors or we can just get a particular one that we really, really like. So let's go through the dependencies first. So we've got here our POM file. So we're using Maven as our build management tool here. We can see that we're using Spring Boot starter data JPA. So we're going to be using Java objects to interact with the database. We have a REST API, so naturally we have Spring Boot Starter Web and Play, and we have Flyway in play to uh, populate our database and create our schemas for us. I'll show you that a little bit later on. We're gonna be using Postgres for this, so here is our Postgres dependency. And as per usual, we have Lombok to reduce our boilerplate code for us, and then we just have the Spring Boot Starter Test dependency as well. So pretty basic setup here. So what's so special about this application that's gonna demonstrate transactions to us? Well, we need to understand a little bit more about it first. So let's start at the domain model, shall we? So here's our book, no surprise. There's our ISBN, which is a string, which is its ID. We have a title, which again is a string. And then we have a link to the author. Note, this is using, of course, Spring Data JPA. So we have our entity on top. And hey, this is the table that it relates to, the books table. So that links to our author. What's our author look like? Pretty similar stuff. We have here an entity, table authors for the author. And we have an ID here, which is a long 
notice that we've got a sequence generator and a generated value. What this is going to do is when we create a new author, it's going to give it an ID, which is next along. So let's say we had 100 authors and we created a new one. The ID would be 101, create another one, 102, sequence generator. That way each author gets a unique ID. And then we have an author's name and we have the author's age. So this is the bit that's gonna allow me to demonstrate transactions to you. We're gonna say, for the sake of argument, that an author's name can be no longer than 20 characters. How are we going to make that happen? Typically, you would do some validation inside of your application, but in order to demonstrate transactions to you, we're actually just gonna do a database constraint. And when we try and create an author, which has a name longer than 20 characters, we're gonna get a runtime exception. And it's gonna be the runtime exception that's gonna trigger our rollback. But more on that in a minute. Let's look at that database constraint. So if we go down here into the resources directory, so it'll be source main resources, db migration, v1 initial. So this is a SQL file that Flyway would use to set up our database for us. So we can see here, it creates our table of authors and we've got the sequence created. This is the sequence that's gonna be used to get the next ID in the list. So each author can have a unique ID. And here's us creating our table authors. And then we create a set of 100 authors just to populate our database. So there's a whole bunch of authors, their ID and their age. Scroll down a little bit further here and we can see we're creating the table for books. So there's our ISBN, there's a title, there's our author ID because each book has an author. And we can see here that we're creating 100 books in our database and then linking them to their author. The Shadow in the Attic, The Last Ember, The Last Harvest, The Crystal Key. So they're all in there, 100 of them. That all seems pretty okay. Where's our constraint? Well, if we go back to the authors here, we can see on name, we have a constraint called name check, which checks that the character length of name is less than or equal to 20. So if you have an author whose name is greater than 20 characters, that constraint is not going to be met and you have a problem. And that's it for the SQL. So let's work our way up through the application before we then look to test it. So we're gonna start our persistence layer, then look at our service layer, and then we're gonna look at our presentation layer. So here we have our book repository. We can see it extends CRUD repository, which gives us that create, read, update, and delete functionality. But we don't have to implement it ourselves because Spring Data JPA. We can see that this particularly deals with the book entity and the ideas of type string. Go over to the author repository, which deals with authors. We can see it right here. This also extends CRUD repository for our create, read, update, and delete functionality. But I suppose the difference is that the author has a long type ID, whereas the book has a string type ID. That's it for our persistence layer. So let's go on up to our service layer. And this is where you're going to see something a little bit weird. So this is a standard book service for dealing with books. You can see here, we can check if a book exists. We can save a new book. We can find a book by its ID. There's the ISBN. List all the books, delete a book by its ID, all standard basic stuff that you might want in a service to deal with books. Let's look at the implementation. And we're gonna go straight to the save for one very good reason. The rest of the class is very boring and everything works as intended, usually just by calling the book repository. So what's so special about this save method here? Well, it's implemented in a very strange way. Let me show you. There's a comment up here which explains it a little bit, but we're basically implementing this in such a way to show off transactions. So it goes in several steps. So for our save method, it takes a book. We check, first of all, if the book has an author. So if the book author is null, then we're going to throw a runtime exception. We're going to do this basic validation because if we're creating a new book, it should have an author. And if we're updating a book, then it should have an author. This isn't a production app, so this is fine for the moment. So we take the book's author that we know it has, and then we go through these steps. So first things first, we're going to save the book without the author, something you typically wouldn't do, but stick with me. So we're gonna set the book's author to null after taking a reference to it up here. And then we're going to simply save the book using the book repository. So that book's gonna be saved to the database without an author. We're then gonna move on to step two here, where we create or retrieve the author from the database. So in the case that the author is brand new, it doesn't have an ID, we're going to create a brand new one. And that's what this does here. So if the author's ID is null, we can see that we're just creating the book's author here. We're taking the saved author and then we're setting it on the saved book. So that book, it's a brand new author assigned to it. 
If the author does have an ID, so it's an author that already exists in the database, then we're simply going to retrieve it and we're going to set it on the saved book. If the ID doesn't relate to an author that's in our database, again, we're just gonna throw a runtime exception. We probably would do some proper validation in a production application. And then we move on to step three, where we save our book with the author attached to it. And we return that. So why do we go through all of this hassle to save a book because we could just use Hibernate Cascades, which would do all of this for us. Well, the reason we're doing it in this way is because of transactions. What we have here is different processes. So the first one is save the book without an author. And then we have retrieve or create an author. And then we have save the book with the author. So we want all of these to happen or we want none of them to happen. Prime case for demonstrating a transaction. So that's our service layer. Let's go to our presentation layer. And if we look here, we have our book controller has a reference to the book service, which we are injecting via our constructor here. And if we look, the create update endpoint takes an ISBN, which is specified in the URL here. And then in its body, it takes a book object. And then it's simply going to save the book. If the book is brand new, it's creating a new book, then it's gonna return a HTTP status created because it's created a new book. And if it's just updating it, it's gonna return a HTTP status 200 okay. But that's enough information about the application. Let's see how transactions actually work. So our application depends on a Postgres database. So let's start one up. We have a Docker Compose file here, which just starts up a Postgres database. Let's go down to the terminal and go docker hyphen compose up. And this will start up our database for us. Looking good, it's all ready. Now then, let's start our application, which we can do using Maven, Spring Boot, run. Okay, the application started up absolutely fine and it looks like that SQL script's run via Flyway and populated our database. Let's go test this application using Postman. So here we are in Postman and our application is running on localhost port 8080 and we can go forward slash books with a HTTP get verb in order to list all of our books. Let's do that. And there we go. We have a list of books return, Shadow in the Attic, Beyond the Horizon, The Last Ember, so on and so forth. And each of these books have their author returned as well, looking good. That's not gonna help us to demonstrate transactions though. In order to demonstrate transactions, we need to call that create endpoint. So let's go over here. So we have an endpoint here, localhost 8080 forward slash books, and then it has an ISBN. Now this ISBN doesn't exist. I can prove that because if I hit the send endpoint on this using a HTTP get, we look down here, we get a 404 not found. So this book definitely does not exist. So we've got here a title, which is let's see, pastries. And then we have an author, which is John Jacob Jingleheimer Smith. Definitely more than 20 characters. Let's just go for the success case. So I'm going to remove John's rather long name and we'll change the HTTP get to a HTTP put. So what we expect to happen when we send this is that this book will be created. And because our author, John, doesn't have an ID, it would also get created and returned to us with a HTTP created. So let's send this. There's our 201 created. And if we go down here, we can see the ISBN title, let's eat pastries, the name John, age 48, and it has the ID of 101 for our brand new author. Now, if we switch back to be a HTTP get, which we can get a book using its ISBN, we expect it also to be returned, proving that it exists in the database, HTTP 200. And there's our ISBN title, 101, John 48. That's all well and good, but let's show why we would want a transaction in our application. So let's put John's massive name back in there and let's change Let's Eat Pastries to a brand new book, which I've uh, started writing called Let's Eat Cakes. And in this case, John can be, I don't know, 35. I'm going to change the ISBN here. Uh, I'm not going to be creative. I'm going to change 111 to 222. And if we do a HTTP get, we'll see that we get a 404 not found. So this particular book doesn't exist because it's brand new. And this particular author doesn't have an ID. So they also don't exist. What we're expecting to happen here is a HTTP 500, an internal server error. And the reason is that this John Jacob Jingleheimer Smith name of our author is greater than 20 characters. And we haven't set up our application to know how to deal with that. Let's change this to a HTTP part and let's send this to get an error. 500 internal server error. Oh no. But here's the thing, if I then change this back to be HTTP get and then send it, we can see that the book was actually created. 
We can see here that the ISBN that we provided is right there. The title Let's Eat Cakes is there, but the author is null. Because the book was able to be saved absolutely fine without an author, the problem only started when we tried to save an author with a name longer than 20 characters. This is a prime example for a transaction because in this case, I wouldn't want the book to be saved at all. If the author's name was too large, I don't want a book to be created without an author. I just don't want a book to be created. So how do we make that happen? It's pretty easy. So let's go back to the code. Oh yeah, quick interruption. So I'm trying to make software engineering as accessible to as many people as possible, but I need your help to do that. So if you found today's content useful, be sure to like and subscribe because it really helps the channel out. And if you know someone you think might benefit from the content, be sure to share it with them. I'm sure they'll thank you and it would make me very happy. Thank you so much. So here we are back at the service and we can see it's no surprise why we got the result that we did. Step one was save the book without the author. That succeeded, but everything blew up when we tried to create a new author with a name greater than 20 characters. So how do we make it work such that it all happens or none of it happens? Well, you may have already noticed, but we have a commented out line here, which is at transactional. So by putting this annotation on top of this method, a lot happens behind the scenes. So note that we can only put at transactional on a public method. And the reason we can only put that on a public method and not a private method or a protected one or a default one is that when we put at transactional on a public method, behind the scenes, a proxy to our class is created. And the reason a proxy for our class is created is because Spring is going to wrap our save method in some additional functionality. It's going to start a transaction, our logic inside a save is going to run, and then it's going to close the transaction. And if anything goes wrong inside of that transaction, so if a runtime exception or one of its subclasses happens to be thrown, the transaction will be rolled back. So now our save method is annotated with at transactional. Let's restart our application. I can show you what a change of a single line can do for our application. Okay, the app is running absolutely fine. Let's flip over to Postman. Okay, to make this a nice clean test, what I'm going to do is change the ISBN up here from 222 to 333. And if I click on send with a HTTP get, we should expect there to be a 404. This book doesn't exist. Now then, if we change it back to be a HTTP pup, we can see exactly the same data as our failed case earlier. The title, Let's Eat Cakes. And then we have the author, John Jacob Jingleheimer Smith, a name greater than 20 characters. The only difference that we've made is that we've put at transactional on top of that method. So let's send this and see what we get. But spoiler alert, we're gonna get a HTTP 500. That's expected, but there is going to be a difference. And the difference is that the book and the author is not going to be saved. Whereas previously, the author wasn't saved, but the book was. Let me show you. Oh no, a 500, everything's gone wrong, except has it. So let's change the part to a get, and let's try and retrieve this book. Remembering previously that it was created, I'm expecting it to get HTTP 404 because the transaction rolled everything back. Let's test it. There we go, HTTP 404 not found. And the reason being that even though saving a book without an author went successfully, when it got to creating an author which didn't meet the database constraint, it then rolled back the previous creation of the book because it was inside of the transaction that was being rolled back. And hopefully you'll now understand why we had to do a really gross implementation of our save method. So this is a really contrived example, but once you get into semi-complex domain models inside of your database, you will almost certainly want to start using transactions. As per usual, I'm going to push this code up to GitHub and I'll leave a link in the description below. And there we go, an introduction on how to use transactions inside of your Spring Boot application. Now, if you're watching this today thinking, I wish I knew a little bit more on how to use Java objects to interact with the database, or well, lucky you, you should check out this tutorial here where I teach you how to use Spring Data JPA, which covers all of that. I'll see you over there.